Americans are capable of achieving extraordinary things when they have the freedom and opportunity to do so. This is American Potential, and here's your host, Jeff Crank. All right, well, thank you for joining us on this episode of American Potential. I'm, I'm actually recording this, believe it or not, from Juneau, Alaska. And the reason I tell you that, I have two quick a couple of quick stories that happen. Then I'll, I'm going to get to the main podcast here. Don't you hate when you get in at one o'clock in the morning, midnight, get to sleep. You finally get to sleep. I've changed a couple of time zones. And at 5 a.m., the alarm goes off in the hotel room because the last guy, I don't know if they do it to be a jerk, if it's an accident or what, but who, who leaves an alarm set for 5 a.m.? In a hotel room. I don't understand. I don't understand. Here's the other thing. My heat register, it's, this is the old heat where it's radiant heat. You know, it's like it's uh, water through copper pipes, which is kind of nice because it heats and warms up the room in a kind of nice warm way that most people don't get to experience anymore. But this is, this is the thermostat tip on the wall. Turn, if, if it gets too hot, the warm air must be released by window ventilation. Try opening the window only a little if it is very cold outside. I won't tell you the hotel, but those are my conditions uh, here in Juneau, Alaska. <laughs> it's, it's quite interesting. Well, listen, my home state of Colorado has something really special about it uh, from a from a government standpoint, something that other states don't have. They probably wish they did have. Colorado, well, let's let's do this. If you look at other states, if you're in, say, Connecticut, you can go to bed one night and then wake up the next morning and open the newspaper and find out that the legislature went in and passed a tax hike that was a hundred million dollar tax hike. And they did it without any vote of the people without any discussion. They just did it. And that happens in legislatures all the time. But it doesn't happen in Colorado because of something called the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. And it's something that I think is 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 a great solution to big government. And we'll talk about what that is uh, in just a minute. My guest is a, a, a friend for many, many years someone who I have known a long time and is the Colorado State Director of Americans for Prosperity, Jesse Mallory. Jesse, thanks for being with me. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Good. Have you ever done that where the alarm went off at 5 a.m. in in a hotel or something? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, no, actually, I have because it's uh, my kid's sports travel schedule. I have to set my alarms. And then if I'm traveling for work during those times, too. I will uh, I'll get in late and suddenly my alarm goes off several hours before I need to wake up for this <laughs> for that exact reason. And it's, it's something I just I just love. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's always it's always fun. Well, let's talk about the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. Um, first of all, let's explain to folks what the Taxpayer Bill of Rights is in Colorado and how it came to be. Sure. So in Colorado, we have the Taxpayer's Bill of Rights, which says very simply that if if the state is going to do a net increase on taxes or debt, it must be approved by a vote of the people and that the government collects more money than is allowed, population plus inflation, for a state spending cap, it must be reimbursed back to the people of Colorado. So uh, so just last year alone, Colorado taxpayers received checks anywhere from $750 to $1,500 per household because the government collected more money and was allowed underneath the Tabor cap so that tax revenue goes back to the people. We're due to see uh, more refunds this year and even into next year. And what what Tabor what Tabor does, and its most basic form, it puts the people and elected officials on mutually beneficial agreements. So the government has to create a package in which will benefit the people, because the people are the ones who pay for it. So they so they propose an idea, they they propose it to the people, and then we go out and we have a vote. Well, and. One of the great things about Tabor, or as it's called Tabor, and we've got to be careful not to just refer to it as Tabor because most Coloradans refer to it as Tabor, and it's the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. But 
One of the great things about it is it it does a couple of things. One, it requires the vote of the people on tax increases, but two, it also limits the the rate at which government can grow. And so if government grows over that limit, even by accident, if they project tax revenues are going to come in at at a, a X amount and it comes in higher than that, they have to, by law, refund that money back to the taxpayers uh, unless they want to go ask to keep it and they still have to go to the voters and ask. Um, there's no other state that has anything anything close to this, I think, as it as related to protecting taxpayers. Do you agree? No, Colorado is really unique. And what, one of my favorite things I hear from the from the people in Colorado, predominantly on the left, who like to attack it, they say, well, no other state has this. And, and it's funny because over 78 percent, over 78 percent of Colorado support the taxpayers' bill of rights. <laughs> Uh, that is both parties and by large margins. And they'll say, well, no, their state has this. And, and Coloradans, we love that. We're like, that's great. We, we'd love to be the state that has this, that other people look toward and say, hey, they don't have this problem in Colorado. And, you know, we, we have predictability in our tax code. You're not going to wake up one day and say, wait, taxes just turned to what? Because when the legislature, whoever proposes a tax increase, they, they, it has to go to an election in November, and everybody gets a blue book sent to them. And it is literally that is a blue book <laughs> that outlines the the pros, the cons. Both sides uh, get to submit their information. I, I've worked with the usually opponent side on these sort of things, saying, "Hey, here's you know here's what it will do. Here's why we oppose this. We think this is a bad idea." And so the people get that ahead of time. They can read it, they can study it, and then they can make an informed decision. It's it's not somebody who's counting the three, three house members, 18 state senators and one governor, you have to actually go out to the people who are going to pay for this proposal and convince them why you think it's a good idea. That that's uh, the, and that's such a, so well put, um, you know, a friend that we both know, Laura Carno, actually, uh, I have to give her credit for this because she may listen. And if I say it without giving her credit, she'll say, Hey, <laughs> uh, but uh, she coined this phrase, and I think it's great. She said, look, if you're going to reach into somebody's pocket and pull money out of their pocket, isn't it just polite to ask first? And I mean, that's so true, right? If if you're a parent, you don't you don't really appreciate it when somebody when one of your kids runs over and grabs your wallet and just takes money out of it without asking. Why shouldn't government be held to that same standard to ask the citizens if they're going to take more of their money? Uh, ask them if it's okay. Isn't that right? Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things I heard that, that's always bothered me is people will say, well, gosh, these table refunds are only this amount or, or we're only asking for this much. And how you don't know where everybody's situation is financially, the, the struggles they're facing as a family, they might be, you know, they might be on the edge. An extra $50 a month may have a detrimental impact to them, especially in, in a situation now where Winter in Colorado, it's a little different than winter in Alaska, I'm sure. But, you know, winter in Colorado, it's January and February are extremely cold. We're, we're paying hundreds and hundreds of dollars in utility rates, and that's an entirely separate conversation. But, you know, that extra $50 that somebody that they want to take from you or withhold from you, that that can have a lasting impact on your family because of all the other strains and, and inflation and other things that are impacting people. So that's, that's a bit, one of the biggest benefits of Tabor is that people can go out and make, they can make an informed decision. Do I want to invest in this or do I not? Is this, can I use this money myself or do I want to give it to the government? But what it does is it it, it forces, like I said, it forces the government officials to come in and make that case to the people. It's not, I'm, I used to work at the Capitol. I worked down there nearly seven years and I can't tell you how many of them said, well, I know what's best for people. (laughs) <laughs> they don't know what's best. And and it would drive me insane. I was like, how dare you think that you know what what they should do better with their money than they do? Like, it, it's just actually, it's just total hubris. Yeah, it, it, it really is. And, you know, th- that's the argument that this is somehow, you know, unfair to government. I mean, government has every opportunity under the Taxpayer Bill of Rights 
to ask for more money. They just have to ask. All they have to do is say, hey, we've got some excess revenue. We'd like to keep it and we'd like to use it for X project or Y project. And and many times when they do that, the voters actually let them keep it when when they Mm -hmm. spell it out. Right. No, they do. And. We see it on the, on the local side, it happens all the time. People say, hey, we, you know, we want to build this project. We want to, we want to help this school. We want to do, you know, name the issue. And, and people do it. But when the state comes in and where the state fails so often, is they come and say, we need this money for education. We need this money for transportation. And then the one time the voters said yes to it, the, the money didn't really go there. And when the voters asked and they said, hey, where, where did this money go? They were like, well, the need's so great. Right. And it, it, which is code for, it, it's kind of like those people you know who say, oh, man, if, if, if I could get a raise at work, I would pay down my debt. I would you know, invest money in this. And instead, they go out to dinner all the time. Like, <laughs> I mean, it's the exact same attitude. That's a pretty good description of government, actually. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, here's the other interesting thing about the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. It doesn't just apply in Colorado. It doesn't just apply to the state. It applies to all levels of government unless they have a vote in which it's it's overruled and and uh, the, and then they're not bound by it. But in most counties and most cities in Colorado, the Taxpayer Bill of Rights applies to them, too. This isn't just the state legislature. This is city councils, county commissions Mm -hmm. and others that must ask permission to raise taxes. Exactly. And and local governments have taken those to say, hey, we, we want to be able to keep revenues up to this amount. And they made the case and then the people can decide, yeah, we, we want to trust you with that. Or maybe we'll only give it to you for a few years. And then after that, we want to revisit things. But like I said, it creates that mutually beneficial arrangement between the citizens and government. It's let, let's not forget there, there there's not government money. It is taxpayer money. It comes from the taxpayers, it comes from the businesses, <laughs> this it, you know, the government's not being generous, sending back Tabor refunds as much as they like to claim they were. It was they they were constitutionally required to do so. And for local governments, especially, it, you know, it's easier for them to make the case. And like I said, I see those withholding or, you know, keeping taxes level or higher. And, and there's a lot of variations of it. But But they go to the voters. They say, hey, look at this project. Here's a project we want to work on. And that's why and people trust their local officials, they'll do it. But more times than not, they say, hey, we, we, want, we want to only do this for so many years and then we want to see. And I, I think that's good. There should be, to me, there should be, you know, a healthy tension between citizens and government when it comes to this. Like, the, the idea that we should just blindly trust them to, to adjust levels as they see fit. Just tells me you've never met an elected official before. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. What are some of the arguments? Because th- there's a lot of politicians, and we're going to get into this: politicians, elected officials, who who don't like the Taxpayer Bill of Rights and try to try to find inventive ways to get around of it around it. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But but what are some of the big arguments that that they make? Those people who want to to get rid of it and say, oh, you know, voters shouldn't have to ask for for this uh, approval to keep more more money. Uh, what are some of the arguments that people opposed to the Taxpayer Bill of Rights use? Well, you know, they make a lot. I think the biggest one I saw was years ago, there was a lawsuit. It was Kirby Hickenlooper, which sat out to uh, it was a bunch of elected officials and special interest groups that shockingly want to see tax levels go up constantly, who said this is actually against a Republican form of government. So think about that. <laughs> the government, government officials were suing the state of Colorado and, and the people right. saying, saying, you telling us no to tax increases is anti democrat you know is against the republican form of government cuz we get to make that decision yeah. i mean the, i mean i'm like the audacity of these people to think that you won't overturn it so we're going to sue you over it and, and it got thrown out and it was a whole thing but, but but that case actually i think went to the 10th circuit in the federal yeah. circuit didn't it i mean it, it, was, sure it almost it made far. it to the supreme court yeah it went really far 
And uh, the main culprit behind that, uh, Andy Kerr, who was a state elected official, I mean, we, we would go rounds about Tabor all the time because he was convinced, he and others were convinced that you don't have a right to vote on tax increases. You elect them. And if you don't like what they do, you can vote in two to four years. And I said, look, that's, that's not how it works. Yeah. <laughs> and the people of Colorado want to have that, want to be part of that conversation, even as badly as you don't want them to be on it. Yeah. So, so their argue, their argument was so, uh, so basic that it basically said, uh, you know, the, a Republican form of government says that you elect us to make these decisions. And now you're mm-hmm. trying to take that decision away from us and, and pull it back. I mean, <laughs> That's pretty. It, yeah, it, it was it was absurd. It got thrown out. Yeah. And but uh, and one of the other things I, I, I hear is because of Tabor, we can't we can't fund education. We can't properly fund our health care system. We can't do all these things, which is code for. We can't raise taxes to the level we want them to in order to get the government we want. Because <laughs> right. my, my favorite thing is they come to me and they say, Jesse, you know. How you know how much of government do you want to cut? And I say, how about this? How much more do I need to pay in taxes to get the government that you think we should have? Give me that number. Right. And they no, nobody on the left ever wants to have that conversation. They don't want to tell you how much more. They, they got a progressive income tax proposal idea to give you an idea, but but the thing is, is that they they always blame Tabor to say we can't fund this because of Tabor, and it's just not true. Voters in Colorado passed Amendment Twenty Three that said. We want education funded at these levels, and rightly or wrongly, we could argue whether we should put those things in the Constitution about required increases in spending. But the bottom line is the people of Colorado came out and said, we want you to fund education at these levels. Okay, the people spoke. The legislature is supposed to listen. The legislature now has the, uh, it used to be called the negative factor. Now it's called the balance or budget stabilization factor and they call it the BS factor, which is ironic because, <laughs> because now they say, well, we'll just like keep a tab of how much we owe. So we have the amount we fund K-12 plus we have the negative factor, BS factor, whatever you want to call it to say, but this is more money we owe. So even then the legislature says, we know what you said. We didn't listen. When the people of Colorado said, Hey, we want you to, let us have a vote on ta- on fee increases because they got clever and they said if we call it a fee and Colorado Supreme Court gives them a lot of a lot of room on this, so they start calling everything a fee. It's a premium as a percentage of your. So they call it. They say new one's a premium. It's a percentage of your income. And I'm like, that's that's literally a tax. It's literally right. the definition of, of a tax, but they call it a premium. Right. And you know, in the courts here in Colorado, say so it's fine. So. Um, so anyway, they, so they, they came out and they said, the people said, Hey, we don't want this anymore. The legislature in their because uh, America's prosperity is suing over this. And, and the state's defense was, well, yeah, the people passed it, but we don't believe we have to listen to them. This is actually what they said. Right. Now tell me, should we trust these people <laughs> with our best interests <laughs> when it comes to taxation, when they've shown in two major cases that they say, look, we're just going to ignore what you said. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's that's incredible, Jesse. Do, I I've never heard that. Do they really call it the BS factor? No, they. That's exactly <laughs> what they call it. Now they call it the BS factor. But the first time I heard it, I thought they were making a joke, and I laughed, and then everyone got quiet. And I was like, "Oh, I'm sorry, I missed something." <laughs> Maybe I wasn't in the meeting when they named it the BS yeah, factor. You know, <laughs> I, you know I, I'm not the I'm not the best marketing guy in the world. But no, I think that's a bad idea. If I <laughs> hey, you, you do you? Well, look, the government probably paid somebody a lot of money to market that and come up with that. <laughs> That marketing yeah. name, it's, BS Factor. Yeah. That's funny. It's incredible. Okay. You can't make it up. No, you can't. You can't. So um, it, 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 you mentioned how they have come up with inventive ways, and the Colorado Supreme Court has allowed them to do this by saying that this only applies to taxes and not to fees. And mm-hmm. so all of a sudden, the Colorado legislature and politicians who want bigger government and uh, and sort of still say that they support Tabor because it's so popular, all of a sudden decided, well, I'm not going to call this a tax. I'm going to call it a fee. And it got so absurd that they even levied a, a fee, they call it, on gasoline. Now, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a few cents per gallon 
increase in the gas tax. But in order to get they would have had to take that to the vote of the people, which it would have failed, likely failed. Yep. So they call oh, it. it yeah, they, they called it a gas fee so that they could impose this at the pump. And every single citizen of Colorado now pays more for gasoline because they did that. And that I mean, that's actually just making a mockery out of voters. But talk about some of the crazy ways that they're calling things a fee instead of a tax to get around the taxpayer bill of rights. Yeah. So let's talk about the gas tax. It's funny. <clears throat> even they call it a gas tax, which is ironic. Uh, they say it's a gas tax, but it's a fee. And so, so the legislature came up with this idea. They wanted to, they wanted to invest this money in transportation, which is really code for, we want more bike lanes and some other things. And, no, and not roads, because if we create roads, people drive on them. That's <clears throat> what they said. And so they so they created these enterprises. Enterprises, for those of you not aware, an enterprise is a quasi-government entity that can set rates. So for our gas tax, for example, they, they delayed it because people couldn't afford it in the summer of, of 2022. But in the beginning, in the spring of 23, people can magically afford it. It had nothing to do with the election. They They, they confirmed that. But they came forth. They said, we're going to delay this gas tax until after the November elections when people can afford it. And what it does, it says it starts at two cents and ratchets up with inflation in perpetuity. But here's the thing. The enterprise now controls this. The legislature washed their hands of it. Hey, we, we have no control. It's the enterprise. So now we have an unelected board who gets to make these decisions, hence why AFP and others are suing over it to say, Hey, if you're gonna if you're gonna create all these fees, and so we passed Prop 117, which said if you're gonna do that, you have to come to the vote of the people. Right. That's simple. Right. Simple. People loved it. it passed a huge margins. And this was a and, and this was the, a statewide ballot issue that that was yep. put on, and the voters of Colorado said, "Hey, we agree. We don't want politicians kind of lying about this and calling something a fee. So we're gonna we're gonna." make a law that says you, if you're going to do that, you still have to come back to the taxpayers. So they did that. Then yeah. what? And the legislature said we ignored it because it's a citizen initiative. That, that's, that this is their current legal defense. We don't have to listen to them. That's amazing. Now, now explain. <laughs> yeah. Now, so now explain to me why the voters of Colorado should, should trust them and say, let's remove the taxpayers bill of rights and allow them to increase taxes, increase debt, and they promise that they'll listen to us and hear our concerns. It's like you've proven consistently over time you will not. Mm -hmm. Therefore, this is why something like Tabor is so important because it keeps that level of accountability to them. Because if we didn't have these other protections, I, I can't imagine what would be happening here. We, we would look like Illinois. We would look like California. Yeah. Well, and that's that's that was going to be my next question is like the, the, there would be people who say, well, they're just going around it. They're finding inventive ways to sneak around the taxpayer bill of rights. Is it really that good? Um, and, and what would your answer? I mean, you, you kind of answered that. But what would your answer to that question be? Here's the thing. <laughs> I love to have this conversation with people because they say, well, if it's so great, why do they go around it? I said, the, the legislate politicians are always super creative and passionate when it comes for ways to spend more money. Like, like nothing will stop them. And my argument's always been if they took that same intensity and tenacity and how to save money, <clears throat> can you, can you imagine what a, what incredible functioning government we would have here in the state? But we don't. Right. So, so my thing is that. When people have to go to such great lengths, when they have to fly in the face of the law, the voters, in order to to try to go against it, I think we have a great piece of of taxpayer protection there because it it, it makes them have to go <clears throat> go to such great lengths in order to do it. They they can't do what Illinois does, <clears throat> which is you know meet just a few days before a holiday, pass a tax increase, and be like, "Gosh, nobody said anything when we did it." Well, no one really knew you were doing right, it. Right. <laughs> And that's the thing is that in Colorado, at least when they do it, we can have a giant spotlight on what they did with the negative factor, with um, with the Prop 117 lawsuit that we, we initiated because of them avoid calling taxes fees. Like we, we can shine the spotlight on what they're doing and then we can hold them accountable and say, hey, did you know your elected official did this? And I can tell you the conversations at the door, people are very unhappy. 
Yeah, I, well, I, I know that they are, and it, it is one of these things that is so, I mean, honestly, to to do that, to say, well, it applies to to taxes, but not to fees, and so we're going to start calling everything a fee. If you think about that, it's really just politicians deceiving voters. I mean, it, that's, that's ultimately what it is. It just comes down to them blatantly kind of being dishonest with voters about this and sneaking around them to try and get more money out of their pocket, right? No, that's, a, that's absolutely right. But the thing is, is that what I love about this conversation is, you know, it, you got these different organizations, different parties, and everybody kind of sticks to their, you know, the tribalism of, you know, we like to talk to our echo chambers. And what I love about this is it transcends partisan labels, it transcends socioeconomic status. Like we can be in a wealthy neighborhood, we can be in a working class neighborhood, we can be in everything in between. And, and we can talk to people, whether they voted for Trump, or whether they voted for Biden, they, they believe in Colorado that these protections should be honored. And more importantly, what they want to see is they want to see the legislature and the people who they, who they elect into office respect them and to, to respect the place that they have in this conversation. That's really what it comes down to. It's the voters saying, hey, you're supposed to respect my opinion in this, and I don't feel like you are. And, and I think that's the thing that really that a lot of these anti-Tabor folks are forgetting is that you know people here passionately, they, they want to be seen. They want to be respected in this process. And all they're asking the legislature to do is to honor the systems that they voted in that they put in place. Yeah. Um one last twist of the knife that I think we haven't discussed yet, and that's that's how I would describe this, is that in the last election, some of the politicians that have really spent their careers fighting against the Taxpayer Bill of Rights and, and really trying to get rid of it, sign it, trying to get onto lawsuits to try and uh, get it get it abolished. All of a sudden, saw that how popular it was. You said seventy was it seventy eight percent? Seventy eight seventy eight percent of voters support it. That that these politicians all of a sudden kind of said, "Well, if you can't beat them, let's join them." So they all of a sudden changed the name. They don't call it the Tabor <laughs> refund or the Taxpayer Bill of Rights refund, yeah. but the money that's required by law to go back. They they just basically said these very same politicians said, "Hey, just so you know." We know you've had a tough year. We're going to give you some money back. Um, and they called it the Colorado cash back instead of the taxpayer bill of rights refund. And they didn't tell anybody that they were required by law to give it back. I mean, that is pretty, pretty bad trickery. Yeah. It, 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 I'm sure it was just a minor oversight and excitement. <laughs> but, um, so, so here's what happened. And I just want to kind of share the story. So one day I get in the office. And, and at nine o'clock, I get a notification from whatever news channel. It's like, hey, the, the, there's a press conference in the legislature. And we're going live to cover it. And I was like, what are they up to today? So I start watching it. And I see, I, I see the entire Democrat delegation. I see the treasurer, Democrat. I see Governor Polis standing up there. And they start talking about the Colorado, as they called it, the Colorado cash black. They had all the signage made. It was very nice and slick. And they start talking about they're sending people of Colorado certain amounts of money that just magically align with what Tabor refunds were looking <laughs> like. And so in, in the press just kind of sat there into their credit, it, the, the press is like the one about Tabor refunds, right? And then things got uncomfortable. Right. Because none of them wanted to say the T word. <laughs> and it was so funny because, you know, they, they start saying the checks out. And it was a nice letter from the governor explaining about the refund and why it's so important. So what, what we did is we got it. I, I got mine really fast for whatever reason. And so I got my refund letter. We scan it, we red ink it, and then we package it and send it back out in the mail, explain to people, this is actually your cable refund. <laughs> and I started dropping mail and digital ads. I did a commemorative sticker that I sent to all the legislature honoring the day that both parties agreed that Tabor <laughs> refunds are good. And we acknowledge those go back to the people and and actually, uh, the 25th of April is the one year anniversary. And there there may be an organization in Colorado who's got something big planned for <laughs> that week. So uh, <laughs> as uh, Tabor refunds get ready to go back out the door, so it's uh, it'll be something to look forward yeah. to. Well, that I mean, it, this is such an ironic story because you look at the way politicians have 
sort of handled this and they fought against it. They've, they've, some of them have built a career fighting the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. And all of a sudden they come out and say, oh, well, it's called the Colorado Cashback. We love it now. It's it's great. But yet they still continue to go to court uh, behind the voters' backs to try and get the Taxpayer Bill of Rights um, defeated and removed from our from our system in Colorado. Uh, Jesse, where can people, if they want to know more about the Taxpayer Bill of Rights or the, the, the efforts that you're doing to defend it, and by the way, Americans for Prosperity in Colorado has become one of the really main defenders. I know there's several other groups that work with Americans for Prosperity to do it, but you've put a lot of uh, of heart and soul into the defense of the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. Where can folks learn more if they want to know about Tabor? Well, we have a we have a landing page that outlines a lot of this stuff, and it's just protecttabor.com. So that's protecttabor.com. You can go there. You can you can email legislation. You can read about some of the things we've done, and um, you know, t- take an active role in in seeing what this is and why why seventy eight percent of Coloradans are so excited that we have it. And it's protect Tabor. T- Tabor is T A B O R. Protect T A B O R dot com. Uh, is is the website. So, uh, Jesse, thanks. First of all, thanks for all the great work you do to defend the Taxpayer Bill of Rights and stand up for the citizens. Someone needs to do that in Colorado. Uh, you do that. And so does the great staff at Americans for Prosperity. So thank you for that. Uh, but also thanks for joining us today. Yeah, no, thanks for having me on. It's, it's been fun talking about this and highlighting a lot of the stuff that's happening here. And my hope is that people hear this and and, and take the piece that makes sense for for you and your state to say, hey, let's, let's, you know, it's like Reagan said, trust but verify, <laughs> especially when it comes to elected officials. So. <laughs> especially. And, and they have shown through the trickery of uh, what they've tried to do on the Taxpayer Bill of Rights that trust but verify is something we should all do when it comes to, to politicians on on these issues. All right. Well, thank you, Jesse. I appreciate that. If if you'd like to get to, uh, connected with Americans for Prosperity and Jesse on this issue or your state chapter, be sure to email me at jeff at AmericanPotential.com. The American Potential podcast, you know, we're always looking for stories like this one or some of the other ones that we tell of citizens out there fighting for the little guy fighting for the taxpayer, uh, fighting and breaking government imposed barriers. And how is this a government imposed barrier? When government takes more money out of your pocket, that's a government imposed barrier, no doubt. Uh, if you're, if you know of people who are doing that, send us that information. The best way to do that is to go to AmericanPotential.com. You can fill out the share your story section there. And we will look at that and we'll get back to you and uh, figure out uh, a way to hopefully tell that story as well. The best way you can stay connected to this podcast is by liking the podcast and subscribing to our channels, as well as follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Thanks for listening to American Potential. Thank you for listening to American Potential. You may listen to more stories from Americans working every day to expand freedom and opportunity in their communities by visiting AmericanPotential.com.